Hi. Before we get into our message this morning, I want to share something with you that was a result of last week's message. When last week's message, I made a mention about me going to Birmingham to follow in the footsteps of the civil rights uh, uh, movement. And I talked to you about a march that happened in Birmingham around 1963 that was called the Children's March. And I told you how we had watched the video and how it was the Children's March, not necessarily Dr. Martin Luther King's protest that really broke the back of segregation in Birmingham, which was considered one of the most racist cities in our country. Well, I was blessed this week to be to have somebody who was a part of our Sermon No Bible study from across the country reach out to us because she had been attending our Sermon No Bible study. And in listening to what she heard, she wanted us to know that she was one of those children who was in that children's march. Her name is Ruby Hunter. And Ruby Hunt, rather. Uh, yeah. And she is go I'm going to she gave us her testimony and shared a little bit about her experience. And so what I want you to do is listen to her right now. I thought it would be a blessing for you to hear from her herself and to see her for yourself. Well, welcome, Ruby Hunt, as she just shares with us a little bit about what she went through in terms of that fighting for our rights and for our freedom as an African-American culture. I just wanted to share this with you because I was so blessed by it when I saw it. I thought you would be blessed by it. After you listen to her, we'll get right into our word. Uh, the uh, Concerning the children's uh, meeting at, in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, May, May 2nd and May 3rd, this was actually the children's time to be taught. We went to 16th Street Baptist Church. We mm -hmm. were instructed on what we needed to do. We were told that if we could not do this, that we should not, if we weren't gonna be, if we get upset or angry, we should not participate in this. Mm -hmm. And so that, those two days we were with, uh, I chose to be with the crowd that was involved in the fire hose uh, mm. episode. And uh, that was part of A.G. Gaston's building. And I tell you, I didn't think the significant of it, but I, you know, I just keep reading it. And so I just want him to know that, I, I, that there is somebody still living. <laughs> Who was involved in that? Wow. Oh, wow. wow. Oh, good. <laughs> so it was, it was myself and my friend Carrie Jones. It was the two of us from that community that participated in that. But we all got together at the 16th Street Baptist Church. Well, good morning, my ECF family, and welcome to our, our online service. And thank you so much for joining us today. I trust that you've been blessed by the worship and, 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 and the spirit that has been going forth in this worship. And I pray that if there's any information regarding our announcements that you're not clear about, please call the church office any day, Monday through Thursday, between 9 and 4 p.m. Our staff is here to serve you and to help you. And we are, we are just so excited about you being a part of our online line family and we just want to make sure that we meet your needs and service you as best we can amen we're working on making this online service a little more interactive i mentioned that before haven't forgot about it we're still working toward getting some individuals and getting some things in place before hopefully before the end of this first quarter that will even enhance your worship experience with us online so pray for that and listen and be 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 aware and alert from when it begins to happen and be prepared to respond when we do so, okay? Listen, today we begin a brand new series of messages. First of all, I want to thank all of you who are online sending me your words of encouragement, and your words of appreciation for our last series as we finished First Thessalonians talking about an authentic life. Thank you. I just want to give you a personal uh, uh, word of appreciation because you've been encouraging, and I appreciate each and every one of you. Now we begin this second series of messages uh, in Second Thessalonians. We're going to talk about a theme that is entitled Stand Firm because what Paul does in this second letter with his with the Thessalonican believers, 
he sends this letter to them a few months later, and he encourages them about standing firm because he hears some things. But we'll talk about that in just a moment. So if you would, turn me with me in your Bibles to the book of 2 Thessalonians, and we're going to be looking at chapter 1 today. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. One. We're going to be looking at the whole chapter. It's only 12 verses. We're going to be looking at the whole chapter today. And while you're turning there, let me give you our quote for the week. Our quote for the week simply says this, only the willingness to suffer can redeem suffering. Let me, okay, pause. I'm going to think about that for a moment. Only the willingness to suffer can redeem suffering. Pause. You might be saying, what do you mean? Only the willingness to suffer can redeem suffering. What, it, what the, state, the statement is trying to help you understand. When we change our perspective about suffering, suffering doesn't become as hard as the enemy intends it to be. So as long as we feel we shouldn't suffer, as long as we feel we shouldn't go through tribulation, as long as we feel like these, these problems shouldn't happen to us and these situations happen to us, every time they happen, they become points of discouragement, points of frustration, even points of defeat. But if we remember what Jesus said, that in this world you will have tribulation, if we can remember what Paul said, that in my weakness you were made strong, when we can remember that when I go through the trials and tribulations, of life. It's not about putting me down. It's about glorifying Christ. It's about giving him the glory that because as he suffered, we suffer. And Paul, Peter reminds us that we, we can't glory with him unless we suffer with him. When we recognize that suffering God allows in order to help us become more like him and to identify with him and to manifest his glory in our life, then the suffering doesn't become as hard or difficult. Matter of fact, we can meet it with joy and expectation like Paul. So therefore, the willingness to suffer <laughs> is redeemed by, by su redeemed suffering, meaning that the suffering doesn't become as bad as it could because my perspective on the suffering is different. I know I'm going through this for the Lord's sake, and because I'm going through this for the Lord's sake, I'm willing to do that. And that's what Paul begins to, is commending and encouraging these Thessalonican believers in his second letter. As he writes to them and begins to encourage them about some things, he encourages them about their stand and about their posture in suffering because they had come to the point of recognizing they were willing to suffer. And because they were willing to suffer, it redeemed their suffering. It caused their suffering to bring them glory and blessings rather than bring them trials and tribulations. Are you with me today? So listen, the, the text says, the, the quote says, only the willingness to suffer can redeem suffering. You got to be willing to go through this because you know that's what God calls you. And as long as you're willing, it doesn't, it's not as bad as the enemy intends for it to be. Amen. Listen, so if you're in First Thessalonians, you found Second Thessalonians. Have you got it? We're in chapter 1. Uh, so let's begin our reading, okay? Second Thessalonians, chapter 1, reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. This is what the text says. It says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus returns from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to glorify, to be glorified in his saints and to be admired of, uh, among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. 
Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to bless your word now to our hearts and to our spirits. We ask you to grant us wisdom as we share and that you would guide our conversation by your spirit as we seek to understand the application of this word in our lives. Speak, Holy Spirit of God, for your servants are ready to hear. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Listen, I haven't done this in a while because I realized the last couple of Sundays I've been beginning, but take your Bible, hold it up. Because let, listen, we got to serve the devil notice. We got to keep remembering to do that. And we can't ignore that because I think it's a very powerful affirmation. And say with a very loud voice, I have the victory. You got it. And the victory is where? Yeah, that's it. In my life as I apply God's word. Amen. Amen. Well, this letter of 2 Thessalonians is a sequel to Paul's first letter to the Thessalonican believers. It is written just a few months later while Paul was in Corinth. See, Paul had received word that some of the Thessalonican believers had misunderstood his teachings about the second coming of Christ. His statement that Christ would come at any moment had caused some of those believers to reason within themselves that since Christ's coming could happen any day, there was no point in working every day. So many of them stopped working on their jobs and start sitting around waiting for Christ's return. They were also using prophecy as an excuse to be irresponsible and surviving off of the generosity of others. Yet others were viewing their continued persecution, as Paul Hyatt mentions in this, in this chapter, as a sign that this must be the day of the Lord or the last day. So therefore, there was no need to, to, to work or do any of the responsibilities of daily living. Paul quickly responds to them as he hears about this, and Paul sends this second epistle to the young church to remind them that whenever the Lord returns, that in the meantime, while they were waiting for it, they, 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 they were to live responsibly in the light of the truth of the gospel. They were to stand firm in their faith and in obedience to the word of God. Paul was concerned that the Thessalonians understood right doctrine and engaged in right living as God's kingdom people. So as he begins here in chapter 1, Paul commends the Thessalonians for their faith in Christ. That's the first thing he does. He wants to see Paul, and whenever Paul writes letters, Paul always has a particular format that he follows. He gives encouragement, then he gives discipline, then he gives encouragement. So he begins with this letter by showing, pointing out to them the things that they were doing right and the things that they were standing in that was right. So he began to encourage them in their faith. Then he consoles these victims of suffering and persecution with the knowledge that when Christ returns, he will reward the faithful and he will punish the wicked. Then he prays that God will be glorified through their faithful and consistent service, that they would stand firm in the midst of their suffering. Are you with me today? Paul would want him to know that, that God has called us in the meantime, while we're waiting for his return, that we would stand firm in our obedience to the word, that we would stand firm in our faith in the word, that we would stand firm in our reflection and and of the character of God and the presence of God in our lives. Listen, saints, if there's ever a time for you and I to stand firm, now is the time. If there's ever a moment in human history where there's a need for believers to stand firm, now is the time to stand firm. If there's ever a place for people, for believers to stand firm, and if there's ever a culture that, pe that believers needed to stand firm in, it's in this 
country, in this place, and in this American culture where we are slowly seeing the precepts and the principles of God being watered down, being compromised, and even being changed. And the aspect of it is, is that they're doing it for the purpose of political uh, rightness and for uh, social uh, uh, agreement and for personal, uh, for people to feel accepted. And yet we are watering down the word and we are compromising the word and we're even changing the word of God. And if there ever a time for believers in our world and in our time to stand firm is those of us who live in the United States of America. It is time for us to rise up and stand up and begin to stay, stay to, to display the unadulterated, consistently powerful word of God. Because the people, the, the average believer in the world today is living a defeated life because he does not understand the principles or the truths or the power of the word of God. Are you with me today? And so I believe that's why God has called us to, to go, jump right from the authentic life into standing firm. Now that we understand what an authentic life is, God says, now that you want to live an authentic life, understand in living this authentic life, you got to be willing to stand firm in the, in the environment and in the culture in which you're in. Because the environment and the culture in which you are in right now is, 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 is challenging anybody who would stand firm on beliefs and doctrine that are contrary to the flow of this political, philosophical, and, 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 and selfish culture. Are you with me today? So, so we, we, we are being challenged today by this word. And listen, Paul, God would want us to understand through the example of these Thessalonians how we are to stand firm in the midst of suffering with our faith. Listen. We all know we, we all live in a state that is earthquake prone. Wouldn't you agree? With California. There's a lot of folks that I know back east don't want to come to California. And my primary reason why they don't want to come to California is because of earthquakes. Well, there's all kinds of devastation all across the country. I left Illinois because of tornadoes so, and of snow. I didn't want to be in tornadoes or snow anymore. So there's always a reason that you can't, you know, and if it stays or something to do, but we are living in an earthquake prone state. And listen, and when, and when there is an earthquake, when there is an earthquake in our culture, as, as we've seen happen just a few uh, months, weeks ago, over a month ago, over in, um, I, I think it was Iran and Iraq. Uh, I'm trying to remember the exact same pl place, but you know what I'm talking about. He said that the earthquake, there was earthquake. When earthquakes occur, buildings sometimes collapse while other buildings stand firm. We noticed that in the in that country. I think it was Turkey that we saw that earthquake that killed. And listen, the, the death rate was ex was extremely extraordinary, over 30, 40,000 people. But we saw some buildings stand while some buildings fail. Listen, and listen, and they go through the same tremor, but the response in the tremors are quite different. So when we're talking about standing firm in our faith, it is because we should make sure that when the inevitable tremors of life come our way, that our faith does not collapse. And that's what I believe God's going to teach us through 2 Thessalonians, how our faith cannot, should not collapse in the midst of the tremors, the trials, and the tribulations that will inevitably come in our lives. We need to, we need to make sure, and I, we need to make sure that we retrofit our faith with the equipment that God supplies in his word to ensure our faith stands when the shaking comes. Are you with me today? And you be sure of this. The shaking is going to come. The shaking, if you will, has already begun. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 27 to 29 reminds us that God says that he's going to shake not only the earth, but the heavens. And that which can be shaken is going to be shaken so that that which remain can remain. So you got to know that there is shaking coming. And in many cases, God's going to allow the shaking to find out where we stand in our faith. So therefore, I believe the Holy Spirit and God's graciousness and love would want to remind us prior that, the, that before the shaking really gets severe, how we need to stand firm. So the question we need to ask ourselves is 
What does it mean to stand firm in our faith? What does it mean to stand firm in our faith? Well, someone once said this, that stand, to stand firm means this. It means to refuse to change a decision or a position. Stand firm means to defy. It means to hold on to. It also means to hold up. It means to withstand. It means to resist or it means to confront with resistance that I'm not backing down. It also means to be brave. It means to endure. It means to weather. It means to face with courage. The Collins Online English Dictionary defines Stand, stand, defines stand firm this way. It says to stand firm means to be or to remain steadfast in conviction despite attacks or efforts to persuade. Are you with me today? To stand firm means to stand against uh, in your conviction, even against attacks or even against people who try to persuade you to believe something different. Listen, God would have you and I to, 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 to be all of these when it comes to standing firm in our faith. God would want all us to have the posture and the mindset when it comes to our faith that we will not change our decision nor change our position, that we would defy anything that would want to make us to change our mind. We will hold fast to what we believe, and we will hold up what we will believe. We will withstand any attack against our faith. We will resist anything that will try to make us change our mind. We will confront with resistance anything that will come against us to try to make us believe otherwise than what the Bible says we will be brave we will not we will not allow fear to overtake us we will endure if we got to go through it we're going to go through it for the glory of God we will weather whatever storm God brings our way in order that we might show him that we trust him and that we believe in him that we will face every trial and tribulation with the courage that only comes from God and we will not give up on our convictions no matter how many times we are attacked and will not be able to persuade us from what we believe. We are absolutely persuaded, like Paul says, that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. God would want us to be all of these when it comes to the idea of standing firm in our faith. Now, listen, let's not take it for granted that we cannot stand firm without wearing the full armor of God as described in Ephesians chapter 6. I'm not making the assumption in this discussion that we are going to be able to stand firm and, and without the armor. I believe the whole Bible is a contextual uh, uh, application of God's principles. So when we're talking about standing firm, we're talking about standing firm in the in in the armor of God, then at the same time applying the principles that we're going to learn through Second Thessalonians to make our armor that much more efficient and that much more effective. So when we're talking about standing firm throughout this series, wearing the armor is a given. Wearing the armor is a given. That that we understand that the only way we can stand firm is with the armor, and the only way our armor is strengthened is by applying the principles we're going to learn through Second Thessalonians about standing firm. All that is is going to just undergird and strengthen the, the armor that we know God has given us to make it, like I said, more effective and more efficient in helping us become what God has called us to become and do what God has called us to do. So Paul, in this text, points out to the Thessalonican believers that they were standing firm in their suffering in three ways. Because if we're in this first chapter, I want you to get, Paul's not telling them what to do. Paul, like I said, is encouraging. He's showing them what they're already doing, and he's pointing it out to them. He's bringing it to their attention. Listen, I see how you are standing firm, and I see the way you are standing firm. And so, therefore, he's going to point out to them how he sees they're standing firm in this chapter before he begins to challenge them about the things that are out of order in the next two chapters, in the next couple of chapters coming. So, listen, Paul would want you and I to learn from these Thessalonican believers that if you're going through a challenge in your life, you're facing suffering in your life, you're facing a difficult 
time in your life. You're suffering something that you didn't bring upon yourself only because you're walking by faith and believing God. You're doing everything that God wants you to do. Paul is going to show you how you need to remain steadfast, how you, how you need to, raise, to stand firm, how you, how you need to stand consistent even in the midst of your suffering, what you need to keep on doing in order that, that you may come out of this suffering the way God intends for you to come out of it. So Paul points out to them there's three ways that they were standing in the midst of their suffering. Paul says that they were standing in the midst of their suffering through, pers through perseverance, that they showed a level of perseverance regardless of what they were going through. He said that they were standing through their suffering and they were being standing firm in their suffering through promise. They remembered the promises of God and he remembers the promise of God that he gave them that was, was theirs no matter what they went through. And so they were, that promise motivated them to persevere. And then he said that they were standing in the midst of their suffering. And they were standing firm in their suffering through power. They relied on the power that God made available to them, that God gave them. And that power motivated their persevution, perseverance, and their power reminded them of the promise. Are you with me today? Though, and so as they stood firm in the midst of their suffering through perseverance, promise, and power, God is telling you and I today that the way we stand in the midst of the suffering that we're going through, we first of all make up our mind. Ain't nothing going to turn me. We persevere. And what makes us persevere is we keep our mind on the promise. And what keeps our mind on the promise is recognize that God has given me the power to be able to endure and go through this so that I can reap the promises and I can become who he has ordained for me to be. Are you following me so far? So let me share with you particularly how these Thessalonican believers were practicing these principles that Paul points out to them that they were practicing even in the midst of the suffering that they were going through. Paul begins in verse 3 of this chapter by saying first of all we are bound to thank we are bound to thank God always for you brethren as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and your love for every one of you about uh, every one of you all abounds toward each other so that you we ourselves boast of you among the churches for your patience and your faith and in all your persecution and tribulation that you are enduring which is manifest evidence Paul says which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God which you also for which you also suffer they were Paul was pointing out their perseverance. Paul was saying, listen, I noticed something that, that, that in spite of your persecution, your trials and your tribulations, there's evidence that you are still growing in God and being faithful to God, that you're persevering because there are certain signs and things that I see. So what does it mean to persevere? The text, of course, it, it persevere means to continue a course of action in the face of difficulty with little or no prospect of success. It means to continue to do or to try to achieve something despite discouragement. That's what persevere means. It means to continue a course of action in the face of difficulty or with little or no prospect of the same. They didn't know how this was going to turn out. They didn't know what was going to happen to them. All they knew is what they believed. And they, all they knew is what Paul had taught them. So they were practicing what Paul had taught them. And listen, and they kept on doing it even though situations have become, in certain cases, discouraging. We read about that in 1 Thessalonians. They were kind of discouraged about the fact that some of their loved ones were dying before Jesus returned. And they were wondering if they were going to be with Jesus or not. And Paul corrected that quickly for them and helped them understand what was really going on. The same thing is you persevere even when it looks discouraging because I still know in whom I serve and I still know in whom I believe. It reminds me of the story of Wilbur, William Wilberforce. I don't know if you remember William Wilberforce. He was the, the young man who fought against the slave trade in England back in the 1700s. Matter of fact, at one point he had gotten discouraged because he had been fighting against the slave trade in England for 10 years and it didn't look like there was any progress that was being made. Slave traders and, and English government was still condoning slave trade and they were still practicing slave trading. And Wilbur, uh, William F Wilbur, Wilberforce was getting a little bit discouraged and was getting a little bit frustrated and was getting a little bit tired 
of the work because it had been 10 years and it looked like there was no fruit and there was no evidence. But one night he opened his Bible and as he began to try to read through it and to get some kind of encouragement, a piece of paper fell out of his Bible and floated to the floor. And when he looked at it, he, he remembered it was a letter that was given to him some time ago by John Wesley. And John, and, and, and John Wesley, by the time he had looked at this letter again, had already passed away and died. So he decided to read the letter again. And when he read the letter from John Wesley, this is what it says. He, he says he's writing this letter personally to Wilberforce. And he says to him, unless the divine power has raised you up, I see not how you can go through your glorious enterprise in opposing that abominable practice of slavery which is the scandal of religion in England and, he says, to, of human nature. He says, unless God has raised you up for this very thing, you will be wore out by the opposition of man and devils. But if God be for you, he says, who can be against you? Are all of, listen, are all of them together stronger than God? The answer is no. So, oh, be not weary, he says, in well-doing. Go on in the name of God and in the power of his might. Wilberforce received his encouragement, and he went on to continue to fight against slavery. And it wasn't until 20 years later that he won his battle in England over the slave trade because he persevered. Because he, 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 he recognized that God had called him to it and he realized that God had given him the ability and the promise that he needed and the power that he needed to succeed. Listen, Paul tells us that these Thessalonian believers displayed their perseverance in the midst of their suffering in three ways. He first of all shared that they, they displayed their perseverance through the growing in their faith. Paul says, one of the things I've noticed about you, that your, he says, that because your faith grows exceedingly. Even in the midst of what they were going through, their faith was growing. Why was their faith growing? Because they were practicing the principles and the precepts of God while they were yet going through the trials and tribulations of their lives. Because they had a different perspective, like our quote said for the week. Their perspective on suffering was not about God tearing them down or trying to get out of front. Their perspective on suffering was they recognized that as they suffered, they were bringing glory to God. And because they realized that they were bringing glory to God and they began to continue to practice what the Bible says and walk by faith and not by sight, their faith began to grow. He said their faith grew exceedingly. Are you with me? It wasn't just growing little bit by little bit. It was growing by leaps and bounds. The more they resisted the opposition and stood on the principles of God, the more their faith grew and the more the power of God was displayed in their lives. He said, not only do I see that you, you are, you're practicing perse your perseverance and your perseverance is being displayed by the growth of your faith, he said, your perseverance is being displayed by the increase or the abounding of your love that you have for one another. That at the same time, there were going through their pride, trials and tribulations, they did not lose their compassion for others. They did, not, they did not lose their care for others. They did not lose their desire to want to serve others or to be what God wanted them to be for others. See, that's the problem sometime in the church today when we face our trials and tribulations and, 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 we, and people don't seem to identify what we're going through. We get mad. We get resentful. We get angry. We stop coming to church. We sit down. We don't do nothing. We don't we even stop giving because we think people are being so insensitive to our needs and so therefore, until, unless they become sensitive to our needs, we ain't doing nothing. But the problem, the, that problem with that is that shows that you're not willing to persevere. That shows that you really don't trust God. That shows that you really are in it for yourself and not for the glory of the king. Because if you were in it for him, you wouldn't worry about what people think or what they do or don't do for you. You're going to continue to do what you know God wants you to do because you're in this for him. You're in it for his glory. You're not in for yours and not for the benefit of people serving you or beating your need. You're in this because you know that your God will supply your needs so in, and, 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 and according to his riches. And while, you, while, while you're going through that, you're going to still be what he wants you to be. That's what these Thessalonians believers were to one another. As they were suffering, as Paul says, your persecutions and your trials that you are enduring, you are still increasing and abounding in your love for each other. You are still growing exceedingly in your faith, and you are practicing patience and faith 
as you face the tribulations and trials that you are going through. Paul says, the other thing that I admire about your perseverance is that your perseverance is, is evident by your patience and by your faith. Not only that your faith is growing, and not only that your love is increased abounding toward one another, but that your faith is being practiced. And the practice of your faith is displayed not only in terms of your obedience to God, but in terms of your patience to wait on God to do what you know he can do and when he gets ready to do it. Are you with me today? Listen, we are some in this world, in our Western culture, we're so quick to want, to want God to hurry up and do something in the moment when he doesn't meet our timetable we're quick to give up on him we're quick to quit on him we're quick to turn our backs on him not recognizing that God was allowing me to go through this one to build me up and two for him to get glory and if I don't understand that perspective then I'm going to miss out on what he has in store for me and I'm going to deny him the glory that he so rightfully deserves and Paul says perseverance produces a growth in faith. That's what he's trying to apply. Perseverance causes your love to increase. Perseverance causes your faith to abound, and it causes your patience to be evident when you're persevering. It don't mean you stand there, grit your teeth, and bear it. What perseverance implies, that you're actively involved in practicing the principles and precepts of God in spite of what you're going through, in spite of what you're facing, and even in spite of what the outcome may be, whether it's favorable or not, you're still willing to do what God would want you to do and be who God would want you to be in the midst of what you're going through. And in so doing, God will bless and show himself mighty if you will just simply remain faithful. He says the key to standing firm in the midst of suffering is to persevere. And perseverance is evident because if you persevere the right way, your faith is going to grow. If you persevere the right way, your love for others is going to abound. If you persevere the right way, your faith will be seen in its practice, and the patience that God is producing in you will be evident to everybody around you. Paul said, we see it. <laughs> That's what he's telling them. Paul said, we see it. We see your patience and faith as we watch you go through what you are enduring. We see your patience and faith. Are you with me today? But see, Paul not only points out to them that they are standing firm in the midst of suffering because of their persecution, because of their perseverance. Paul says he sees that they are standing firm in the midst of their suffering because of the promise, because of what they know and what they've learned and what they believe about the promise. Look at what Paul says to them in, in the next passage of this verse. He says in verse 6 and 6 through 10, he says, since it, is a, it a, since it is a righteous thing with God, he says, to, to repay tribulation to those of you, uh, uh, to, to repay tribulation to those who trouble you. That's what he says. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. Then he goes on and says, and, who, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus re is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And then he goes on and says, and in faming fire and vengeance take uh, upon those who don't know God and those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of God and from the glory and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified among his saints and to be admired among those who believe because you, because our testimony among you was believed. Paul says, listen, I see how you are practicing your endurance and standing firm in your faith because of the, it's evident that you are practicing it because of the promise that you know and the promises that you believe. He says, he goes on and tells him, he says, because you, because you know that God's going to take care of those who are causing you problems. So you ain't got to worry about that. You also are assured of the fact that you're going to be with him when he comes. Paul is reminding them, and he's making the implication in this text. It's not something that he's teaching them. It's something that they already know of, and he's just simply acknowledging what they know. Are you with me today? I don't know if you know the promises of God. I know you want God's promises to be manifested in your life, but do you really live your life motivated by the promise so that that promise makes you be and do what God would want you to do? 
Listen, somebody once said this. They said there's approximately 8,810 promises in the entire Bible. 8,810 promises in the entire Bible. The Old Testament itself has over 7,706 promises of God to his people in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament has 1,104 promises that God makes to his people and to the church. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 28, uh, that chapter alone has 133 promises, which is more pro uh, promises in it than any chapter in the Bible. The Bible is full of the promises. That's what I'm trying to tell you. The Bible is full of God's promises, and every promise God makes is going to come to pass. Because even when you read the book of Joshua, one and, and statement at the end of one of the chapters of Joshua, that every promise that God made to Israel came to pass. And you got to know that every promise God makes to you and I will come to pass. So I can I can reassure that even if the promise is not yet manifest, it will be, and, it, and it's going to be if I continue to remain, remain faithful to the Lord and remain obedient to the Lord. And, it's, it is, and it is those promises that should be the motivating factor for me to remain steadfast and unmovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord. In other words, it's those promises that should motivate my perseverance. Vance Havner makes this statement, and I like Vance. He says a lot of things that I, I like to quote. But one of, the th one, of his other, one of his other quotes with this, he says, we're sitting on the premises when we ought to be standing on the promises. Are you with me today? <laughs> so too often, many of us, we come to church and sit on what God says, but we don't stand on the promises. We sit here, we sit and say amen, but then we get up and face the trials and tribulations of our lives. We don't, we don't, we doubt the promises. We don't believe the promises, and we don't allow the promises of God to motivate us in our obedience, in our perseverance, and in our trust of God. Paul was telling these Thessalonican believers that he noticed that they were being motivated by the promise. Promises like what? The promise to repay those who troubled us. That God promised that, he said. God promised, he said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. God told us that he's going to handle and take care of the wicked. It's not my job to take care of the wicked. It's God's job. So I ain't got to worry about people who persecute me. I just need to keep doing what God calls me to do. I ain't got to figure out when those people who persecute me going to get their just rewards or going to get their comeuppance or get their consequences because that's not my job. That's God's job. But Paul says we have a promise promise from God that he's going to trouble those who trouble us. He's going to take care of those. He's going to repay those who trouble. That's a promise from God. The other promise that, that, that what other promise? The promise to give us rest with him when he comes. The promise to, to, to promise to give us rest when, uh, when with him who comes. Paul says, you're going to, God's going to cause you to rest with us when Jesus Christ comes. So we have a promise to know that, if, that this, this stuff is not going to last always. We have a promise to know that no matter what trial or tribulation that I I'm facing is not permanent and it's not eternal, that this too shall pass, that God's going to give me rush rest not only in this earth for, for a period of time for my tribulation, but more so for the rest of eternity when he returns. That's God's promise. God's promise is to repay those who trouble us. God's promise is to give me rest with him when he comes. God's promise, listen, also not only that, is to, is to exact vengeance on those who don't know God and on those who won't obey the gospel of Christ. Are you with me today? Especially those who would, who would want to try to thwart us from preaching the gospel, those who want to keep us from declaring the gospel, those who want to tell us that the gospel is not of God, those who want to malign and blaspheme and degrade and, 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 and try to make of none effect the gospel of Jesus Christ, who would want to try to get us to believe that there is no God and that we don't need to worship him. God said he's going to exact vengeance on them. He's going to repay those who trouble us because he's going to exact vengeance on those who don't know him and those who refuse to obey his word. The key reminds us of that in Romans. Vengeance is mine, God says. I will repay. And then lastly, the promise is that to, to glorify us with him when he comes. That's what Paul says, and as he says in verse 10, he says, when he comes in that day, he says to glorify him, to, glor to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among those who believe. To be glorified 
in his saints and to be admired among those who believe that that we have the promise that when he does come we're going to be glorified with him when he does come we're he's going to be the object of our worship and the center of our worship because we will see him face to face when he comes he promises us that we will reap all the benefits and blessings that he has in store for us because of our faithfulness because of our obedience and because of our steadfastness when it comes to obeying his word and doing what he says. Listen, these promises, this promise, and I call it a promise because all of these are God's promise. You know, are you with me today? Not just in the plural form, but in the singular form. Every single promise of God is going to be manifested. And that promise to repay, that promise to rescue us from trouble, that promise for us to rest with him, that promise to take vengeance on those who are, who are in direct opposition to God and blaspheme his word and for us to be glorified with him, that's the promise we look forward to. That's the promise that is secure. And that's the promise that should motivate you and I in terms of our perseverance. Because it's that promise that God's going to manifest in our lives for every single believer as he or she walks by faith and not by sight. So Paul tells them that they, they, they display their steadfastness in the midst of suffering through perseverance. They show forth their steadfastness in the midst of suffering through the promise. And they show forth their steadfastness in the midst or their willingness to stand firm in suffering through their through power. He says in the last phrase of the chapter, chapter 1, he makes this statement, Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of God and our Lord Jesus Christ, that, that the work of faith with power, that the good pleasure of his goodness with power, that we be worthy of his calling with power, that we are praying for us with power, that the power of God might be manifested in and through our lives. The word power here in the Greek is the word dunamin, uh, where we get our word dynamite or dynamic from. It literally basically means, as you as we read it also in Acts chapter 1, when he says, I'll give you power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, which is dunamis, which is the, these words are, are derivatives from that word. It simply and basically means two things. Power, it means ability. And it means meaning. The dunamis can be translated, or the dunamis can be translated to mean ability. God says, with the faith, with work of faith with ability. Work of faith with ability, the goodness of his, the good goodness of his pleasure with ability, with the prayer, with the power of prayer and answers of prayer with ability that God was going to give us the ability to do what he's called us to do and to be what he wants us to be as we continue to operate in those aspects of our Christian walk that he calls us to. And I'm going to point out in just a moment, but that word dunamis means, that dunamis means ability. It's the same ability to God, and it means meaning. That this and my work of faith with meaning will have meaning. God has a meaning behind what I do in order that it might bring him glory and praise. So it's not just, just activity for activity. It's activity with the power and the, from the ability of God, which produces meaning not only in my life, but in the lives of others as I share my faith and as, as I display my faith before man. It's, it's, that, it's the same word that is used when God says, and when Jesus said to us in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, when he says, Behold, I give you authority to trample on the serpent and on the scorpion and over all the power of of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Same word, dunamin. It's also pronounced dunamin. Dunamin, dunamay is, as it's dunamin here. Dunamay in our text is dunamin here, and it's the same meaning, ability. So I have the authority to trample on the serpents and the scorpions and over all the ability of the enemy. 
There's nothing that Satan can do that can hinder me or stop me from doing what God has called me to do. There's nothing in Satan's ability that I don't have the ability to override. There's nothing in Satan's ability that can keep me from doing what God has given me the ability to do. Matter of fact, my ability from God trumps Satan's ability and gives me authority over him. Are you with me today? And therefore, I need to understand that as I operate in faith and as I walk through this world and the trials and tribulations that will come my way, that God has given me the ability to overcome. He's given me the ability, the ability to walk in victory. He's given me the ability to be the head and not the tail. He's given me the ability to succeed. I need to apply the ability by yielding to the Holy Spirit in my life. And by obeying what his word tells me to do. Paul, we stand firm in the midst of suffering through power by three things that Paul points out in his text. We stand firm in, our, in the midst of our suffering through power in three ways that is pointed out in this text. We stand firm in our suffering through power by prayer. Paul says, therefore, we pray always for you. That's what he said. We pray always for you. Listen, my brothers and sisters, I said it last week. I'll say it again this week. We need to stop taking prayer for granted. We need to stop taking prayer for granted. We need to stop believing that prayer is just one thing, one check off our list, and then we find other things to do to take care of the things that we need to take care of. We need to recognize that there is power, and we say it all the time, but do we really believe it? That's where the rubber meets the road, is that there's truly power in prayer that if we pray and we believe, we don't have to worry about anything else. We don't have to get up and try to do anything else. We ain't got to figure out nothing else. We just need to wait on God to do what he says he would do because we pray. Because that's where our power lies. Our power lies in prayer. That's where it lies. That's, that's why God tells us to pray without ceasing. That's why God tells us to pray always and, and pray uh, without fear, without doubt. That's why God says don't worry about anything but pray about everything because there is power in prayer. For great men and women of God, we read about in the Bible, always found victory when they prayed to God. Are you with me today? God showed up and he showed out. So listen, the first one of the things that he says, we st how we stand firm in the midst of suffering through power is by prayer. We also stand firm in the midst of suffering through power by faith. <laughs> faith energizes and motivates. Prayer energizes and motivates faith, and faith at the same time energizes and motivates prayer. You cannot have faith without prayer, and you cannot pray without faith. <laughs> Amen. So, so that they both go together, and God tells us that's where our power lies. And see, and again, we negate our faith in so many situations. We believe we negate our faith for the things that we think we can do ourselves. That we we have faith in stuff that if we just in case God don't turn out, I can still do it myself. That's not faith. Faith is trusting God for the absolute impossible. There, if if and listen. What real faith is, that if I put myself on the line for, uh, to do something or believe something, that if God don't do it, I'm going to fall flat on my face because there ain't no way I can get it done. If God doesn't show up in this situation and do it, it's going to fall, fail. It's not going to succeed because there's absolutely no way I can do it. That's where faith really begins to show up. That's where faith is displayed most in the places where the impossible is done because God specializes in the impossible. And that's where God calls us to stand. That's where God calls us to live. That's where God calls us to have our being. Four times in the Bible, God tells us that the just shall live by faith. We live in the realm of the impossible. We live in the environment of the unbelievable. We live in the atmosphere of the unthinkable. That's where God wants us to divide and to live. Because when we stand there and stay there, trusting God to do what he can do, he shows up every single time. He reminds me, I'm able to do it exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ever ask or think. But it requires your faith to believe for him to show it up, for it to show up for you. And so God calls you and I by faith because power for our lives lie in our faith. If we're going to stand firm 
in the midst of the suffering and persecution that we face in this life, it's going to be that we rely on the power that God gives us through faith. And that faith motivates my prayer. And my prayer is manifested because of my faith. Are you with me today? Last and finally, he says that the third thing that, 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 that enables us them to stand in the midst of their suffering through power was by grace. He says, according to the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know what grace is. Grace is unmerited favor. Grace is God looking beyond my faults and supplying my needs. Grace is God is not only just God forgiving me and, and not holding my sin against me, but God blessing me in spite of my sin and God showing himself mighty in my life in spite of my frailties, my faults, and my apprehensions, and even my doubts and my unbeliefs. That God's grace shows up to give me the second, third, fourth, fifth chances that I need to step up and become who he has ordained me to be and fulfill what his purpose is for my life. It's the grace of God. And listen, that's, that's the power of God's grace in my life. Listen, I don't take for granted the grace of God in my life for not one single moment. Every day when I wake up, I recognize it's the grace of God. It's the grace of God that touched me. It's the grace of God that woke me up. And it's the grace of God that gives me the opportunity to go through the day to do what he wants me to do for you and for myself and for my family. It's the grace of God because you don't have to do it. You don't have to do it. Listen, listen, God has every right to deal with us according to our sin. And he has every right to wipe us out according to our sin, not just the sin that we do, even the sins that we think. God has every right. He has no obligation whatsoever to allow you and I to live. But because of his grace, <laughs> because of his grace, because of his grace and his, 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 his motivated by his love for us, that he, that he gives us these moments and these opportunities to encourage one another in the word, to worship together, and to lift his, hand, hand, to lift, lift, lift his name and glory together, and to be able to move and have our being in the places where he's planted us. It's his grace. And listen, my brothers and sisters, God would want you and I to understand that when, we, when it comes to standing firm, we cannot negate the power of grace. No more than we can neglect the power of prayer and no more than we can ignore the power of faith. God requires you and I to operate in these places in the midst of what we're going through by his power. And his power comes through prayer. His power comes through faith and his power comes through grace. Listen, God calls you and I to stand firm in our generation. And that standing firm is not, going, is not going to be without tribulation. It's not going to be without persecution. It's not going to be without pushback, challenge, trials, and problems, and in, in some cases, downright rejection from others. It's not going to happen without that. But in order to be able to stand in the midst of that, you need to know that God has given you the ability to persevere. And, that per and as you persevere in faith, your faith will grow. And as you persevere in faith, your love for others will grow. And as you persevere in faith, your patience and your faith will be demonstrated and practiced before those with whom God would want you to demonstrate it so that as they see it, they will be encouraged in their faith. They will be encouraged in their love, and they will be encouraged in their faith. God would want you and I to understand he calls us to persevere, and that perseverance is based on his promise. He has promised us, and his promises are yea and amen. He will not negate his promise. He will not give up on his promise, and his promises will come to pass in our lives. And those promises should motivate us to stand where he wants us to stand and be what he wants us to be. Because no matter what anybody does to us, God's going to repay. No matter what we go through, our rest is going to be with him. No matter who tries to stop us from preaching the gospel, God's vengeance is going to come against him. And you got to recognize that no matter what, 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 what's going to happen in the end, he, we're going to be glorified with him and he and us, and we're going to spend eternity with him forever. That promise is ours, so that promise is secure. Without a doubt, it's going to happen, which motivates me to stand firm now in perseverance and to stand firm now in power. 
consistently praying, never taking it for granted, walking by faith and believing God for the impossible, knowing that he's quite capable of doing it, and standing in the grace of God, recognizing that even when I blow it, I can fall on my face and ask him to forgive me and get right back up and get back in the race because his grace allows me the opportunity to do so. And in so doing, I can continue to stand firm and be what he wants you and I to be. Let's continue with me and journey with me now as we go through the rest of this book and learn more about how to stand firm. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for your word today. And we thank you for what you've shown us through the Thessalonican believers here in chapter one. Thank you for reminding us of our need to persevere because sometimes it gets so discouraging. Sometimes it gets so frustrating. But you have given us what we need to stand if we would just allow our faith to grow and allow your love to work through us. God, we thank you for the promise that we can stand on and rely on to be real and come to pass in our lives. And we thank you for the power that you didn't leave us to do this on our own. You've given us power and our power comes through our prayer and faith and your grace. And so we thank you for that. And Lord, Lord, as we hear this word and as we receive this word help us to apply this word help us to let the fruit of this word become real in each and every one of our lives it's in your name we pray and we thank you for it and all of god's people said amen amen listen and for those of you who are listening and watching me this morning as you've heard this word and you've received a prayer regarding this word maybe you are asking yourself well pastor i hear you you're talking about standing firm, and you're talking about standing firm in persecution and perseverance, rather, and promise as well as in power. But I'm not really sure if and I can do that. I, I, I find myself wishy-washy in my faith, I, in my belief. I find myself not really sure about whether or not I do believe or whether or not I have a relationship with God. And listen, and that might be you, you, you are in that place where you're searching, you're kind of checking stuff out, you're trying to figure out which is the right decision to make. Is Christianity real or is some other of these religions that you're hearing about, are they real? How do I know if what I'm choosing is really real and really of God? Listen, I want you to understand that that's, that's a legitimate search for every uh, person who has not made a decision for Christ. But I want you to also understand that in, in doing that search, you need to understand one thing about f Christianity as, as related to other religions and belief. Other religions and belief are a search for God. No matter what religion you choose outside of Christianity, it's a search for God. They're telling you how to find God. They're telling you what you need to do to, have a, to, to know God, to, to discover God, and to find out where he is. And everything they give you are practices and tools and applications to help you gain favor with God and to try to figure out how you, you get close to God. But Christianity is different. Christianity is not a search for God. Christianity is that we found him. Are you with me today? It's not that we're looking for him. We found him. And listen, and we found him in the person of Jesus Christ. God demonstrated his love for us and displayed his love for us by sending Jesus Christ to die. You may have thought he was a great man, a great religious figure like Buddha and Confucius and others. No, he was in essence God in the flesh who came down and lived among us to show us how much he loved for us. And listen, and he is the only one who died and four of those who, he, who followed him and those who would believe in him and rose from the grave. And listen, and he lives today, and he's sitting. The Bible tells us he's seated at the right hand of God. You can go, go to Confucius' grave. You can go to Buddha's grave. You can go to Zoroaster's grave. You can go to Mohammed's grave, and you can see the tombs and tombstones and all the candles and everything that people are putting up there. But if you go to the grave of Jesus, there's an empty tomb. The stone is rolled away. You go inside. His body is not there because he's alive. That's why it's not a search for God. It's because we found him. And the key to knowing him for yourself is to believe. Believe in what he did for you through the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus came to die so that you and I might have a right to eternal life and that we might know him. Jesus said while he was here, no man comes unto the Father but by me. So the only way you can have the relationship with God and know him for yourself in an intimate way, the way we talked about in this message and the way Paul had let these Thessalonians believe is you got to make a decision for him for yours. You got to decide in faith, as we talked about right here, faith that you're going to believe what God says. That's what faith is. You're going to take 
take God at his word. And then based on taking God at his word, you're going to make a decision for your life based on that faith in God's word. And the decision for your life God is asking you to make is to surrender your life to him. To surrender all of you into his hands, knowing that as your creator and your God, he has a plan for you and a purpose for you. And he's going to lead you into that plan and purpose so that your life can be full and meaningful. So if that's what you want to do today, if you believe what you've heard and you believe what I'm saying and you're willing to put your faith in it, then bow your heads and close your eyes with me right now. And then repeat this prayer after me. Now, this prayer itself is not the key. I'm asking you to be sincere, to be genuine. As we talked about in our last series, be authentic. Be real with God. Make these words your words and speak them with as much sincerity from your heart as you can. And don't talk to me or repeat after me just because you hear the word. But use these words and say them to God. And I promise you, if you are sincere and you're speaking to God, when we're done, listen, what will happen in your life, will, in your case, will be unspeakable. But in, in, in biblical terms, you will no longer be on the outside. You'll be on the inside. You'll no longer be searching for God. You will have found him. Bow your heads and pray with me and say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I open the door of my life and I receive you as my Savior and my Lord take control of my life. Forgive me of my sins and fill me with your spirit. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer with me and meant what you said, welcome to the family. <laughs> you're saved. You're in relationship with God. You're Listen, the Bible calls, says you're born again. You're a brand new child in the Lord right now at this very moment. You're saved. You're destined to, to experience the promises that we talked about in our, in our message today. Now, the thing I want you to do is you need to know what the next steps are. Now that you've made this decision and you've accepted Christ, you need to understand what the next steps are. On the screen is appearing a QR code. A QR code is appearing right now. Listen, get out your devices and scan that code if you can. Scan it right now. It's going to take you to a page on our website and it's going to give you three, three choices. The third choice says, I pray to receive Christ. That's what you just did with me when you prayed that prayer. Click on that choice. Fill out the contact information just below that and go to the bottom of the page and hit submit. I promise you that when that information gets to us, somebody from our church office is going to contact you within the next 24 to 48 hours. They're going to reach out to you by phone or by email and, and wanting to pray with you, wanting to encourage you, and then wanting to share information with you about what comes next so that you can really enter in this relationship with God and experience all that the Lord has for you. For those of you who are technically uh, challenged and may not have quickly get to the QR code, our web website appears on the screen as well. Go to the website, find the icon with click praying hands and do exactly what I just told everybody else to do under the QR code because that same page will appear for you. Listen, please let us walk with you. We are excited about your new journey. We're excited about your new relationship and we want you to experience everything that God has for you. So please make sure you get us your information so we can walk with you and, sh and, sh and pray with you and help you grow in your relationship with God. And again, thank all of you for joining us today as we worship. I trust this word bless you and I trust Trust that you're motivated to join us for the rest of this series as we continue to study through the book of 2 Thessalonians and God teaches us in our day and time how to stand firm. You guys have a blessed day and the Lord says the same. I'll see you next Sunday. Take care now. Bye-bye.